I think it's really played a large role in shaping yeah, who I am as for, a person. For me as well, for me as well. I have fond memories of, you know, you're coming here in the morning and the, the owners used to be gathered there. Yes. Yeah. One of the brothers who come along, look at you from head to toe. Uh, your shoes shining, your tie tied. Uh, Doesn't matter how hard it is, your blazer needs to be on. You, Mr. Yeah, you you know, know, the world is joint. The world is joint. <laughs> <laughs> I think we built very good relationships. The meaning behind being called the Bali Boy just represents so much. It evokes in me the beauty of life on the Cape Flats at the time. What it meant in those days to act manfully was to do the right thing. Taking care of those around you. Look me in the eye, shake my hand firmly. Be loyal to your partner, be respectful. Acting with honesty, humanity, and without fear. And I don't think it's just about nostalgia. I really think there's something deeper than just wanting to go down memory lane. I think there was something at the core of the school that made people think differently. I believe that the school opened at the end of January in 1941, which is quite amazing actually in my mind, uh, being during the war with its own challenges and hardships. And I believe it was the first high school in the Athlone area, area and the first Christian Brothers school serving the coloured community. My name is Mark Renner. Most of my teaching career was at St Columbus, which was very enriching and fulfilling. Religious education was very much part of our curriculum. The founder, Edmund Rice, his goal was education for the poor. You know, we know that Ireland was also subjected to huge discrimination and oppression. You know, King Quechueo Mpande, Quechueo said famously, first comes the trader then comes the missionary, and then comes the red-coated soldier. But the missionary is part of the formula. And, of course, African tradition of religion is undermined. You can't get away from that. But the balance, in my opinion, rises in favour of the missionary as time progresses. Because I think they were genuine. There was great affection and love. They, they did devote their lives. It wasn't just uh, learning the three R's. Kitchen that this was a, a affluent school, or that we came from particularly well off yeah. families. Yes. Wasn't the case. You yes. know, my dad was a security yeah, guard. Yeah. My mom was a, a nurse at Rescott yeah. Children's Hospital. You know, but it's just what the school represented. Perhaps because of, of the fact that our parents paid fees. But like we would hustle, like like when when it came to the textbooks. Second hand textbook. Yeah. This, this was this a school, school. card. So this, you had the, the staff room here on the left hand side. Right. And right. these are two eight classes over there on either side of the principal's office. Yeah. There was a door access to the principal's office from the other side That's as well. Right. That's right. Yes, when you That's went when to consult you with the principal, well, you went to the secretary's yeah. office. Yes. When it was for hiding, for hiding you, went, you, you went on the other side and you yeah. stood at the bottom of the stairs. My name is Ivona Rabello. I coordinate the work of Catholic education in the Archdiocese of Cape Town. There were poor children at St. Columbus, and, but most parents regarded it as a prestigious school. It was a school where you would get good discipline, good moral values, good spirituality, and you would get good academic education. We often talk amongst each other and say, if you had to repeat your life over, which aspects would you do the same way? This is something I would do exactly the same way. I guess when I look back at St. Columbus, the main thing that stands out for me is the sense of camaraderie. You know we call ourselves Bali Boys, right? And it sounds like such a silly name, but it has such an emotional attachment. 
who am I? Okay, Tony Voges. I guess we would be your typical Catholic family. I had uh, seven siblings. We had to move, you know, the Group Areas Act, we had to move out of our house in Hoodstock. My oldest brother, Peter, went to St. Columbus. His friends would pitch up at the house and the stories that emerged from them being at St. Columbus just made it very, very attractive. My name is Mark Engelbrecht. I was at St. Columbus from 74 to 78. Coming from the primary school that I was at, being a co-ed school, it was a different experience being in a boys' school. There was a lot of tradition, ways to behave, ways in which to to conduct ourselves. You know the motto of Rilde mm. Aja, and mm. I didn't have to look it up. Mm. I knew it was act manfully. You didn't realize it at the time, but the values that you were taught just out of that small motto yeah. really shaped, well, for me anyway, it mm. shaped how yeah. I became an adult. I teach high school, you know, and I'm, I tell the kids that in the bus and in the train, Yes. The St. Columbus boy got up. I distinctly remember one or two of the older boys brought one of the younger boys in, mm. like an initiation thing, and they, they made him stand on the desk. And we saw what was happening. Mm. We came in, we said, guys, we don't behave like this mm. at this school. That's not how we behave. We actually look after yeah. the new boys that, coming in. That's we teach we them do. the traditions yes. of the school. That's we what teach we them what it is to be that's what men. Yes. And being a man doesn't mean that you bully others. Absolutely. Being a man actually means that you protect people. I'm Taswell, Taswell Papier, and um, um, I've been appointed in 2017. So I think this is my fifth year as a, as a judge. The vision of a 13-year-old way back in 1975, I think this level of achievement could not be imagined in one's wildest dreams. The system of apartheid was such that it was not intended for black people to in fact succeed as professionals. Thus in 1953, the government took over complete control of Bantu education, so it alone could decide how much or how little could be taught. So we will recall the famous speech in Parliament, why teach a black man maths when he will not be given an opportunity to use it, the categorization of so-called coloreds to be trained to become the artisans, and white people to become the bosses, and the education system and the entire apartheid system was geared to achieve that objective not to produce black judges. I'm, Gio, I'm Dr. Gio Perez. I'm the chief director for health in the province. I attended St. Columbus from 1976. I was sent there by my mother to get a good Catholic education and to get a good male role model because my father had passed away when I was very young. The school was a private school established by the Catholic Church to support the principles of the church but I, I think for a long period also of the state. There were those who were very sympathetic towards the liberation struggle, but I fancy there were more who were very sympathetic towards the apartheid dispensation because of the old link between Africanism and Irish nationalism. Ireland and South Africa fighting together against dominion status and the undermining of the empire. And that died much later than most people think. St. Columbus was, of course, located in the heart of the community in Athlone. It could not escape the brutality of apartheid. That generation was probably made up of three different groups of people. The one said, get a good education and get out of the country as quickly as you can. The ones that keep your head down and you'll be okay. And then there were those people who said, let us see if we can change the status quo so that everybody in the country could um, reap the benefits of the country. In 1976 in particular, it was probably a minority of students who left the school to protest. I remember the brothers being concerned about the safety of the children. Lots of tensions between parents and students, because obviously it was a fee-paying school. The school starts at 8 o'clock, you get there at 7, you have an hour to sit and study. 
free periods. Well, at that time it was never called a free period, it was called a study period, and with reason. The Christian brothers were very focused on making sure that every boy got the best results that they could. We were constantly reminded about the results that came out in the newspaper and that St. Columbus would be of the top schools. I was of the opinion that the best thing we could do was to educate ourselves as best as we could and as well-educated individuals go out and make a change. I, I was probably had an unpopular opinion that striking and staying out of the classroom, what, I didn't think that was productive. So in a sense, there was a separation which felt very, very uncomfortable. In 1976 was an unbelievable year in South Africa. Traumatic, very, very, very traumatic. One of my classmates, Jason Matthews, was shot in the leg um, in one of the protests. And uh, I think for, for many people it became alive that politics actually affects our lives. And then there was a horrible situation where the schools in Cape Town marched to Alexander Sinton. We stayed behind at the school. After a while, messages started flowing back about students being beaten up by cops and all that sort of thing. So we approached one of our teachers who has since passed on, Mr. Trupas, and we drove out to that area, right? And at that moment, a police car came screeching around the corner, stopped. Cops jumped out with batons and they beat the shit out of Trupas in front of us because he was obviously the white man in, you know, with us. And um, it was horrific. It was absolutely horrific. I think that that signified a political awakening um, for the school community. The principal at the time, Brother Madden, he was distraught, absolutely distraught. And I remember him coming to us and saying, I honor what you're doing. This is what we suffered as Irish under the British. Um, I can relate. So, yeah, it was, boy, I haven't thought about that time in so much detail, but yeah, it was, it was seriously traumatic at the time. Yeah. This class is still the same, guys. If you poke your head in there, this is the same eight class. I remember. Still the same with those exactly the same, discs there the same, at the back. To, to take it back a couple of steps, you know, sort of when I arrived here, there were a fair number of white teachers. That's right, And yeah. a lot of them were here because they were somehow they had come into conflict with the state. We had a number of St. Columbus stalwarts who were at the forefront of affecting political change. They challenged them to be activists, but to be responsible activists. I was pretty sheltered at the time as well, but the teachers explained to us. I remember Pat O'Connell talking to us in Afrikaans class and he switched over from the lesson and we were talking. And he did it in Afrikaans because it was just a lesson as well. We had to respond in Afrikaans too, so teacher to the end. In particular for me, for mm. me, yeah? June Pump. Yeah. Yes. 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 What a teacher. I mean, she didn't teach us only geography. We were awoken. But the one thing that she we were continuously taught us was Think critically. There were 81 schools that came together to plot the downfall of the state. And St. Columbus was a full member of the committee of 81. And there was a lot of suspicion at some stage as to why we were participating in this boycott. Because originally the boycott was about broken windows, which we didn't have. It was about access to textbooks, which we had. But I think it led to a improved relationship with everybody else. We were very involved in the church, and all my uncles were at St. Columbus, and that was the obvious choice, and I had a bursary at the time as well. Yeah, St. Columbus, we always thought we were special. Your friends would look at you and say, ah, oh, you sit St. Columbus, you want to be better than everyone else. It was prestigious being a bully boy. Yeah, so this was kind of like a library and a kind of a, every kind of a thing. The school's facilities were not great at all. We didn't have fancy school fields and soccer pitches and very fancy labs, but the level of education that you got there was fantastic. There's a perception that St. Columbus was a kind of poor cousin to the rich white school in Greenpoint. 
But I think for us at St. Columbus, it wasn't like that at all. I mean, Greenpoint had the CBC blazer and St. Columbus just had a plain black blazer with their badge. And Joe Bell sat them down and I think very nicely said to them, do you really want to wear that pajama jacket? We didn't feel uh, underprivileged here. We, in fact, I think we felt quite privileged. My mom always wanted us to be at St. Columba because of the whole Catholic connection, me and my two elder brothers. Eventually, through the influence of my grandfather, who was able to sell a piece of his land, my mom was able to borrow some money from my, my grandfather and, and therefore at that point could afford to have us there. It's a kind of like a snobbery about it, I think. I especially remember the, the uh, times when I was in the bus kind of keep my posture a little bit different because I'm wearing the black blazer and the tie and, and I go to a private school, you know. But I think other, the other schools and particularly girls in other schools kind of saw this as an attraction. <laughs> we were approximately 300 boys at the school at any given time. There were always two standards per year and it was generally the, the clever class and the not so clever class. I represent the, the, the jock side, the, the, as they said at the time, the not so clever boys, but we had, um, we had some amazing athletes through the years. Um, my name is Brian O'Connell, and I've uh, had a very, very good cricket in this career. I'm sad that my father, when I was 17, well, maybe, I would have just been an alcoholic in England now. <laughs> but Mazel de Oliveira came back with buns down there, were looking for young recruits, and then locked out his leg stump with a nice ball boy cutting in. I was 17, and then I went to bat, and I batted about 10 minutes. Then they asked if they could come see my father, and when they saw him, he said, not on your life. Eventually, I captained the under-21 provincial side, and I captained the A provincial side in 1976. I stopped cricket in 1976 is another story altogether ethics and something that the province did that I objected to vehemently and, uh, and as a consequence of that we, we parted our ways. It was difficult for us as, as coloreds at CBC St. John's. Um, we had to go the extra mile to prove that we were good enough, that we deserved our place even at sport level. Um, I played first team cricket first in rugby, first in tennis, but it took me a lot to prove that I belonged there. In my year, there were some really, really talented sportsmen in general, where it was sort of sprinting, general athletics, and it's a pity, it, it, it saddens me, because I mean, that sporting world, I'm, I'm a bike leader, so now that I know more about that area and the talent we had, it's so sad that we didn't have the opportunity. And that's why quite a few people are still quite sort of sore about that. June Perm in Senate 9, the trouble started brewing. And June, at the beginning of 1979, said, boys, we do not know what the future holds. Matric is a two-year course. If we finish all our work in six months, you use the next six months for revision, and you'll be well set no matter what happens next year. So. We were pushed very hard academically. We then had months of disrupted schooling and many of us were dodging the police. I spent um, probably six months of the year living in with the brothers. So I'm very proud of the fact that in 1980, three of my own class were in the top 20 in the country. That's the one that I know. Uh, a change no, we, we, over, did, we, did Edmund, a, we did Edmund Rice. God has shown his favor, his hand is surely here. Light shines on his words, a light of with so clear. Men died for God. On his streets every day. Hey, now you know I'm a nerd. While he was on the soccer field, I was there. <laughs> I recall being very surprised when I was elected head boy. It was a sharp sense of responsibility. I was too young and too immature to understand what was really going on. At that time, I felt the police were, on, were the good guys. My role model um, in that year 
was Giovanni Perez, the head boy. We had regular um, talks from people like uh, Gio Perez was the head boy at the time. Uh, informing us about what's happening. Some of our friends were in jail. Some of our friends were no longer with us. And it was a difficult time. In Matric in particular, as the country um, burned um, and the city burned, it became more of a responsibility, which I still feel very acutely today. Um, so, I arrived at St. Columbus in 1982 as part of our teacher training process, mentored by Brother Michael Burke, a brilliant teacher, and he demanded you're all. We were very much part of the community. I loved it. We would walk down to the church every morning after meditation and prayers. In our habits, down Lawrence Road, these little white um, uh, people walking down, little ants going down to the church. How remarkable is the religious aspect? Not. This was a Catholic high school, yet we had Muslim boys here as well, but it's... They were like part of the fabric. I, our dad passed away when we were quite young. I was 10, my brother was 8. Mm. My mom, she liked the fact that it was a, a boys' school, mm. that it was uh, independent. But one of the things my mom always used to tell us is be a man. You know, mm. stand up for what you believe. Right. And that ties into our high school experience. Mm. I felt that they were very uh, safe at that school. It was a small school. and. The brothers were very kind and very nice and, and the students, they really cared for them a lot, you know. You know, they were very respectful and in that way they set a very good example for us. The brothers' quarters were in a separate building right next to the school. Almost like a residence type of setup. Very sparse, always very clean. They dedicated their entire lives towards the school, towards the boys and towards their religion which I think is possibly the recipe that made it such a great institution. We always were at St. Columbus quite forward-thinking and around interfaith issues. It was never about converting children to Catholicism. It was about social justice. I'd come to school in the morning and it's a Catholic education. Mm. Right. And then I would go to Madrasa in the afternoon and mm. it would be a, a yeah. classical Islamic education. And for me, yeah. interestingly, what it did was it showed me the similarities and the overlap between mm. the two, yeah. rather than accentuating the difference. Exactly. The lessons that the Christian brothers taught were certainly not apolitical. I came here because my dad was here, and my dad was outraged because Brother Ma Ying introduced me to reggae music and liberation songs, which yes. one learned through that. Mm. Yes. And there was, a, there was a reggae club and all sorts of things at that talent night. Mm. Yes. yes. Each class was given the chance to prepare something and there was a competitive element to it. There were some students that was just so good at taking off the teachers. Young fellow, yes. stop <laughs> pussyfooting around. Who was it? Brother Southall. Mm. Mm. Your lad, examine your conscience. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but what I always used to get from Brother Lynch is, young fellow, walk with me now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Those aren't good words, it's not going to end well. Take me around the back not there. Not end well. Now when we get together, we talk about it and we brag about it. We, we were able to deal with, with, with that, and, but we don't attach cruelty to it. It was just a, a way of thinking and being at that time. Yar! Ah, my bro, I was a regular year. Brother Bell hit a whole class of 20 odd boys the same, yeah. the same with the same energy that he started. Things that I would want to say do differently today would probably be corporal punishment. I mean, we, we, we used to get caned occasionally. I don't think it scarred any of us, to be honest. Uh, but I suppose I wouldn't do it the same way with my boys today. Oh, 
I was two years before matric um, in 1985, which is when we had the major upheaval of the time. We often came to school down Lawrence Road and had to bypass barricade fire. They burnt tires in the road. I was part of an underground community of Cossas. At one stage, there was closure of all the schools called for by Cossas, and the school had said, no, we will not close. The brothers and the staff, particularly, I think, led by the brothers, felt a responsibility to the parents who were paying school fees. From my mom's influence, we, had, we were there for a reason, to get educated, and we were getting educated on borrowed money. So there was no room for us to mess that up. It wasn't always acceptable to the surrounding schools. During the protest action, we would essentially call our COSAS members to come from their schools to our school and essentially to close us down. And I remember at one stage trying to teach when the other schools marched on St. Columbus and they were sitting on the wall around the school and they were banging stones together and then at one stage stones rained down. We all were under our desk in our classrooms. A lot of guys actually jumped over the wall. And Barry Lynch going out onto the, the field. And these guys have um, handkerchiefs tied over the, their faces. But the one guy, the ringleader, I actually recognized him because he was at Muslim school with me. And then he was kind of buzzing around Dr. Uh, Brother Lynch and he had a gun with him. Barry Lynch, I always remember, and the courage that he had because there was a lot of aggression, a lot of anger. So I went up to him and I took the, the, the handkerchief and I pulled it and I said, Rafik, you and your buddies get out because my parents pay fees so that I can learn here. We came to school mm -hmm. and then we actually had like education around what was happening in the country. Uh, groups of people were going off to speak to the, to the then still bad ANC. Mm. The school allowed us to go out when there were protests happening at other schools and you know they had a mass rally at uh, Belgrave High School and you know they buried apartheid, we had apartheid written on the coffin. And while we were walking home the Caspers were coming driving up and down shooting tear gas and we had to run in and shout at neighbors homes. And these protests have been developing for a number of weeks and there'd be these running battles. You know, nobody expected that in the midst of us we'd be firing live rounds. That was a turning point in the way that people looked at how desperate it is. And so on the Monday morning at assembly, when we were instructed we will not be closing the school, we essentially had a walkout. Um, and that was the end of our, our standard eight days in class. Yeah, that was a difficult time. Eventually we had to close, uh, and, but still continued with our education and we gave all the students our home postal address and sent out assignments, correspondence down. And back then the postal system was brilliant still, so we got our work, we finished our work, did our research and things, and then um, if we needed to contact the teacher, they would be at home. So we did that. The poor postman that delivered the mail to my address didn't know what had hit him. What I valued was the fact that, that I didn't actually miss out on my complete year of schooling. When we matriculated, we just did the usual thing that we do on the Cape Flats, which is on the last day of school, we all go boss, as they would say. So we all go wild and just kind of write on each other's t-shirts and stuff. So it was just a day of celebration. When I think of St. Columbus now, I think what stands out for me is the fact that we were taught life values in almost an organic fashion, you know. I do actually remember Robbie Waterwich, great sense of humour, very down to earth. Really, I must say at that stage, certainly not personality-wise the type of person that I would have thought was going to take up arms and engage in the armed struggle. I knew Robbie very well. We played in the uh, church youth group together. We played guitar together. Uh, there Robbie was dignified, principled, soft-spoken, an ordinary guy and a wonderful friend. Certainly one remembers that he was very committed and very committed in his beliefs, you know. Language is inadequate to pay tribute to a man like Robbie Waterwich, a man who for us represents 
the true example of tireless work and self-sacrifice in the fight for freedom of his community and this country. Aluta continua and may he rest in peace. The contribution of the youth, whether it's sufficiently recognized and whether we can improve on that recognition, is of course the important question. In my view, there is room for enormous improvement. St. Columbus and Bullies was for me a space for which I'll always be deeply, deeply grateful. Teaching boys as a young woman was quite a, um, yeah, I, mean, I, didn't, I, I didn't realize how silly boys are. <laughs> Brother Lynch said to me, you don't smile for the first three months. And I think they were very conscious of the move towards getting the voice of a woman because of the patriarchy in the church. That was a time when women were paid lower salaries than men. And we also weren't given maternity benefits. I'm back at school with a two-week-old baby in the storeroom. So, I mean, you obviously got your maternity bra and with all your pads and everything, and, but nothing stops that milk coming up and it needs to come out. I just remember like these 40 eyes, sets of eyes, just staring at me as though I had turned into Frankenstein. <laughs> it said, Miss, Miss, is something coming out of your briefs? <laughs> and I just, <laughs> the lactation, it just like happened. I said, this is why you must not have unprevented sex. I don't think I got any advice from any brothers uh, regarding that subject of, 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 of uh, engaging with women. There were no girls at school. <laughs> And because I didn't have time, there were no girls at home. So I felt that, in a certain way, I, I was very immature around girls. If a girl walked into the school, one lonely, immaculata girl, the whole school would be a buzz. There would just be a, a restlessness in the school. Lambo chaps are funny and um, they're confident. We, we're confident, we'll, we'll joke about anything. I say, we punch above our weight. The degree of bonding that takes place in a boys' school is to a much greater extent that you'd find in a co-ed school. Then St. Columbus became co-ed and it was around the time also when the brothers handed over to the laity. And My mother was looking for a school um, and then they heard it just opened up as co-ed. My mom was a single mother, so she thought it was a good opportunity to give it all. The I found myself there and it felt like home, actually. I think the girls just became boys, really, you know, so um, we, we were great friends. It was quite a rude awakening to learn that you need to do your matric in a, at a different school. 94, 95, things started changing. Other schools became options and there were a lot more options. You had choices of the likes of the Rondebosch, Sachs, mm. Weinberg, um, mm. to, to send your children to. But in those days you couldn't. And you could go there with amazing facilities for free relative to what yes. it costs to come to a, a private independent school here. Yeah. We all went to different schools but today we're still on the same WhatsApp group, we chat all the time and that's what it's nice about it because we still have the caring community that we had back then. What is so lovely now, I think the spirit among the Bali boys is still amazing. There's a group of us that speak on Zoom every Saturday night. I started the Facebook page, and I think it was 2002. I really got into collecting photographs and history. By the way, we interact with each other even today. There's no issues, yeah? So whatever tensions there were at the time, I think, you know, we, we overcame it. We absolutely overcame it. Well, in every state and age, this man who lived for God, Edmund Ignatius Rice, showed all the world a living sacrifice. That's brilliant.
I would say to my 14 year old self, I suppose I would say, do things in exactly the same way that you had done them, you know, which I think is fantastic to be able to do that and appreciate what you've got, which I think we did really. The closure of St. Columbus in 1997 was most certainly a, a tragic moment and with hindsight we could and should have done more. Okay. So the school no longer exists, it's gone. Yes. Other institutions, they can have an alumni society and they can give back. What we've got is who we were. So we become that type of fathers, we become those type of husbands and and sons, Correct. and our kids see that in us. Mm. So that's what we end up without even knowing it. St. Columbus produced men of substance. Around the walls we have some Bali boys, Archbishop Stephen Naidu, and then a very proud Bali boy, St. Columbus, who always spoke so highly of the brothers and the school, um, was Archbishop Lawrence Henry. The missionaries are on the way out. And then, of course, South Africa's changing too. We are going to have to say, well, what is core to being a Catholic school? It's not about being Catholic with a big C. It's, it's about how do we shape human beings to be the best that they can be to serve the common good. Ooh, it was a walk down memory lane. Eh? Oh, yeah, yes. absolutely. It was a walk down memory lane on the Sunday afternoon. What I'm chuffed about is that Al-Azhar actually kept the gate, mm. they kept the yes. name, no. yes. right? Mm. Should have a yes. call put up here. Mm. Fantastic to relive the positive experiences yeah. that we've had at yeah. the school. Yeah. I wish that a lot of other guys get to do something like this, eh? Yeah. Sure, it's amazing. So, so we end off with Buralita Ajay. Yeah. yeah, manfully. Man. Gentlemen, it was good. Uh, Thanks so much for the opportunity, Thank you, guys. Everybody. Thank, you. Hey. Thank you very much. This morning I was thinking, do I know many examples of people that went to St. Columbus who did not live up to those values? And I probably could count them on one end. Uh, there's one fellow who's a bit dodgy, so I might uh, want to add him on, on, as a sixth. But um, it's quite remarkable that you've got a good a set of human beings that were imbued with a set of values, and the school played a big part in that.